Hi everyone. Um, Hi. Welcome to tonight's installment of LJC. Um, I'm your host, uh, Dale. Also co-hosting will be uh, Mokhtar. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat. And also we can go over some questions at the end. And um, yeah, so today's talk is on railway oriented programming um, with Tom Johnson, who's a senior dev at Transfig. Yeah, interesting title. Um, intrigued to hear the content of it. So I'll hand over to you now, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, just for a little bit of context, uh, this is a talk I put together a, a few years ago when I was um, working at Unruly. Um, and recently, I was at a, a lightning talk and somebody was talking about um, either some functional error handling in JavaScript. And there was a big old conversation in chat about basically what the motivation was. Um, and this is what I'm, I want to try and talk about here, is what the motivation is for the concept of functional error handling. Um, so let's just start off with a little bit of background. So um, the problem that we're trying to set out to solve here is that most code fails. Uh, and that would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that most code fails badly. Uh, and to illustrate what I mean, I've got, I've put together a fairly artificial example. Let's say that we want to change an email address on an account. We get a request body coming in through from our web server. Uh, we read this into a domain object so that we can do stuff with it. Um, we then use that to get the account ID from the change request to look something up from a repository. Uh, we canonicalize it to make sure that it's all, um, yeah, uh, smooth out the capitals and make sure that everything is nice and clean and as we normally expect it. Uh, we update the account with a new email, persist it into the repository and then return okay. We've done it. Uh, but of course, this code can fail in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, we might have a malformed input, which, uh, which the object mapper throws an exception on because we can't pass it into our, uh, into our Java class. We might find out actually that it's a perfectly cromulent um, message in terms of its formatting, but there's no account for it. Uh, we might find out that the, uh, the new email is somehow invalid. It's not an email, uh, and therefore we don't want to update it with that new email. We might find out that when we try to update the repository, uh, that um, it doesn't successfully take, uh, doesn't persist in the database for whatever reason. Uh, and this is done by returning a, um, a Boolean uh, for whatever decision we, um, for whatever reason we made that decision. Um, and so we need to handle that. And what we find here is if we have a look at the happy path code, the bit that talks about the stuff that we care about, it's nice and small. And with failure handling, it's much bigger, it's much uglier. We also find that our error handling is intermingled within the code. All of this red code is to do with handling errors. Um, and all of the unhighlighted code is doing what we actually care about. But more than that, we've got exceptions being thrown. We're sort of like checking, um, checking results separately. We've got booleans we need to track. We need to look at null pointer exceptions. These are all different failure handling mechanisms, and it's not clear what we should use where and when. That's what I mean by most code fails badly. It's uh, the, the error handling just completely overwhelms uh, our thought process when we have a look at code that's written in this style, which is tradition, uh, something that we encounter quite a lot in Java code. Uh, I'm now going to do a quick summary of what we're going to talk about in this talk, just to give you a, uh, a, a view of um, where we're going. I'm going to be talking about result, uh, which is a general purpose failure handling construct. I'm going to be talking about railway oriented programming, by which I mean a composable and declarative failure handling approach. And then we'll wrap up with failure patterns which is about um, using these principles to abstract some common code patterns into a nice clean DSL. Uh, for some context, um, may, some of you may have encountered some of these ideas before. Uh, railway oriented programming is a term that was coined by Scott Velashen uh, when he was talking about F sharp. Uh, the principles are not language specific. Uh, I'm going to be using um, 
the library I wrote, uh, right once read many dot control uh, as an example, but I'm not here to pitch the library. I'm here to pitch the mental model. Uh, and if, in fact, I would recommend that you go off and try and build your own version of the library afterwards, just to sort of like understand its mechanics better. Uh, there are also there are a lot of ideas that I'm going to cover in this uh, in this talk. Uh, this is you don't need to sort of like go full hog down it. You might find some uh, parts are useful for you on the day to day, but uh, you maybe don't sort of like subscribe to everything that I'm preaching. That's fine. I'm just trying to um, make you aware of some different ways of thinking about things. So let's talk about failure mechanisms. One of the reasons why the failure handling code in the example I put together was so bad other than the fact that I artificially made it bad to make a point, uh, is because different sorts of errors require different sorts of handling. Uh, we could use an approach like using return codes, like Unix utilities, where they return zero on success uh, and then some other code if they failed. This is only useful if it's a void method, as in it doesn't have a return value that it would be otherwise using, uh, so that we can then use the return value to handle the return value it's super easy to ignore it because, um, because the method is void. It's done what it's supposed to do. So you might choose not to inspect the return value. And the failures are not very rich. Uh, the number of times you've seen a Unix utility fail with error code four and had to go look it up, you'll probably, it, it, this is not necessarily a, a great way of being able to handle these sorts of problems. But returning null. Um, for example, if you look in a map for something and it's not there, it gives you back nothing. Uh, this is, yeah, the, uh, we've all heard Tony Hall's uh, thing about the null being the million dollar, uh, billion dollar mistake. It's insidious, um, it manifests late, uh, so you can end up having a, a function that's sort of like six or seven um, function calls out in the call stack and the rest uh, before it actually manifests, so you don't know where the null came from in the first place. And of course, there's no detail as to exactly what it was that failed or how it failed. There are sentinel values. Uh, so string.index of, if you want to find the, the first f in a string, you can do string.index of string and f, and that will give you the index at the first f. But if it's not there, it'll give you minus one. Uh, so that's an example so where the, the return values that you get, they sort of look like successes. They're the same type. Um, but you need to know that there's something special about that value that it means something else. And of course, again, we don't have a great deal of richness in the failures. Uh, one thing we could do is multiple return values, such as is used in, in Go and some other languages. Uh, so this is sort of like typical error handling in Go, where ET phone home uh, function here returns both a response and an error code. And if there's no error, uh, if there is an error code, then we handle the error. And if there's no error code, then it's a good response and we can handle it. Uh, so there we go, there's our two uh, return values. Now this is all yeah, fancy uh, words around just having um, returning tuples or uh, returning a compound value, which we could do uh, in Java with something like this. Um, and we could get our result and have a look at the result value and, and look at it like this. Um, but of course, one thing here is, whilst it, says, whilst it conveys to the user that there is potential for failure, it's not safe. You can use the success value and just ignore the return value, and there's nothing preventing you misusing it. And of course, it's heavily boilerplate in Java. There's exceptions, um, which, despite being the exception, is sort of like almost like the default um, method of error handling in Java in a lot of ways. Uh, so the good thing is about exceptions. Uh, unlike null pointers, they manifest immediately. Uh, you can have arbitrarily rich failures, which are completely decoupled from the, the success type of your function. Uh, and uh, especially with runtime uh, exceptions, uh, handling them is optional, uh, which, is, which is great, but it's, uh, it's also bad uh, because if you've got errors, you really want to be handling them. Handling must be local, uh, as in it's uh, where you handle an exception has got to be in the code that raised the exception in the first place or something that immediately wraps it. Uh, what else you might say? Well, let's say you, you get a result and you want to, uh, of, of something, you want to serialize this over the network. Uh, you, it, you've lost the exception context in that case. Uh, and it turns out that when you're uh, doing functional programming of, of other sorts, um, exceptions interact very poorly with them. 
They're also kind of heavyweight and expensive. Um, this is probably not relevant to everybody, but if you care about high performance computing in any sort of sense, um, populating an exception uh, is going to be garbagey and it's often going to be quite slow. Uh, if you're talking about runtime exceptions, they don't advertise them well. It's not clear when you call a method whether or not it'll throw an exception. And the try catch finally mechanisms can be quite boilerplatey and even error prone. There's checked exceptions, which are kind of not exceptional because it's saying this is something which we will, which we will definitely handle. Uh, but checked exceptions make Java 8 very unhappy. Um, so let's go back to having a look at uh, our example here where we're trying to change the email address on an account. Uh, if we were to, instead of updating one request body, we try to update a whole stream of them, and uh, the, the, and we have our, um, our, our updating of a single one, just throw the uh, IO exception for, for use to a higher point, we'll get an unhandled exception thing, even though we've got an, uh, uh, throws IO exception annotation. Uh, so that means we, we basically can't use that approach. We would have to catch that in the in the method. Um, there is an approach to handle this using results. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that happens and how, uh, how our change fixes that later. So we've also got Java 8. And since then, uh, we've, got, we've got optionals, we've got streams, we've got lambdas, which makes the water a whole lot nicer. So now, uh, the Java SDK includes optional, which some people have sort of described as a better null, which basically is. Optional, I, optional of a value either contains an example of that value or it's empty. But what makes optional really useful is that when you want to get the value that it may contain, you have to provide um, a, something to handle the, altern the case of it being empty. So you might just give us a, a default value or you might have something which generates a default value. Or you might decide actually, no, based on where you are in your context, it actually makes sense to throw an exception. Uh, you could just get the value, but this is uh, bad. You should not do this. Uh, do, um, if you really, really want to throw on empty, use maybe dot or else throw and at least it's clear what's, what you're trying to do there. Uh, so optional. It advertises the risk of emptiness. It requires the failure handling to be there in order to use the value at all. You can't forget to use it uh, to handle the errors. And it supports composition. Uh, the downside of optional is there's no detail to failure. So what the result is, is it's like an optional, but it's got failure details. So instead of being parameterized by one type, the type that it holds, it's parameterized by two types. Uh, the result it holds if it succeeds. Uh, and the type it holds if it fails, which could be string, could be enum, it could be anything that provides some information to the end user about how you failed. And here's a re really, really basic idea of what a result actually looks like. Uh, it's got one type in it, which is a success, which contains an S. It's got one type in it, which is a failure, which uh, contains an F. Uh, it can't contain anything else. So we have a private constructor in there. Uh, so we can't have any other subtypes. Um, and the only way you can get the value out of it is via this either method, where you give it one handler for success and one handler for failure. The success handler um, takes, the, uh, takes the function given to handle successes and applies it to its internal value. The failure handler uh, takes the other function and applies it to its internal value. Now, this is like I'll say a fairly minimal version that I, as I'd have done it in Java 8. With Java 15, we've got sealed types, so we could make it even cleaner. And we could also have a look at approaches which maybe use pattern matching uh, in the future, um, or even sort of like garbage free value types, records. These are all things that we could, we could possibly do. It doesn't really change the principles. The, 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 the point is, this is what a result is. It's either a this or it's a that. So, uh, here we've got an example where we've got two um, results, one of which contain, is a successful value which contains an integer, and one of which is a failure which uh, contains a string explaining why pi is not an integer. Now, if we want to handle it, uh, we take a, um, 
we've got this maybe print method which takes a result and then has the two cases that we want to handle. Uh, now, this kind of looks a little bit like pattern matching, uh, as you might see in functional languages, but it's basically just it takes two functions and it just happens to then syntactically look very similar. So why would we start talking about this relatively recently? The, the answer is lambdas. This is something that we could theoretically have done since Java 1. But whereas this sort of user, end user experience is nice and sort of clean in Java 8, we go to pre-Java 8, we have to use all these anonymous classes and it just becomes, it's a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, it, it does not engender positivity. So that's what result is. It advertises the risk of failure. Um, it requires failure handling in order to get a value out of it. And unlike optional, uh, it contains arbitrarily rich failures. You can put any type there that you want. Um, and as a result, it can basically handle any error handling case you want. So it can be a universal standard for error handling that, that covers everyone's use cases. And if that, um, that particular phrasing uh, sounds uh, suspiciously familiar to you, it's because it's used in this XKCD comic. I'm aware that uh, just saying that this is better and we should use it instead of everything else, you've got to be a little bit careful about that. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we can actually use it and what it does to your code and hopefully convince you that it's worth actually trying something um, this different. So just to update, we've now handled uh, the what a result is. Now let's talk about railway oriented programming. But before we talk about railway oriented programming, to help you understand what it's about, we're going to start off with carpet oriented programming, which is trying to apply the same principles as we would with railway oriented programming, the same sort of model, um, except we're just using optionals instead of results. So um, there are basically two methods that we care about when it comes to um, carpet oriented programming. We care about map, which takes a function um, and uh, gives us back an optional. And we've got flat map, which also takes a function, but this time it's a function from something to an optional or something. And we'll see how those work in a moment. So let's say we want to make our breakfast. Uh, we've got cornflakes, we add our milk, and we get breakfast. Straightforward. I'm sure this is uh, sort of a familiar experience to many of you. But sometimes you go to the cupboard and you get out the box, and the box does not contain any cornflakes. And so we sort of mechanically go that, well, would we add milk? Well, no, we're not going to add the milk because it's empty. We know not to do that. Uh, and as a result, we end up with no breakfast. OK, fair enough. We've got a step, and uh, we know not to apply it when it's empty. We just carry on, and we get another empty out of the other end. Um, let's talk about flat map. Now, in this case, um, Obviously, breakfast is very important, uh, but that's not the only reason we get conflicts, because uh, sometimes you get a toy in there, and that's nice. Uh, and if you go to your conflicts and you get a toy, you get a toy car. If you go to your conflicts and then you've got no conflicts, the, the box is empty, then there's no point trying to get a toy, because the box is empty. You're not going to get anything out. But sometimes somebody's been to the conflicts before you, and whilst there are still conflicts in the box, there's no toy car anymore. So we can go to the conflicts. We try to get the toy, but we get nothing. That's flat map, uh, because we're trying to do an operation on the, if we add milk to cornflakes, we can always do that, we always get breakfast. But if you try to get a toy out of cornflakes, sometimes that fails. Let's go back to this um, update email case. So we've got all of these various different steps that we're taking, but now instead, we're going to just make all of them return optional instead. Anything that could fail. Um, uh, so we, we start off with our optional, and um, then we will get to the change request. We have to flat map because that could fail. Canonicalizing an email always works. It's just basically string processing to lowercase, things like that. Um, so if you've got an input email, you get an output email. Uh, however, uh, we might, uh, getting the, um, ID of the, um, so getting the thing out of the account repository, um, that might fail, so we have to flat map over it. However, if we get something out of the repository, we can then update the email, that's always going to succeed. But trying to persist at the repository might fail, so we have to flat map. And this ends up 
you know, being really kind of a boast. Um, but what we're doing is we're just getting a result and then we're calling our method on it. So we can go to our IDE and start aligning these things and say, okay, uh, with all of these steps, we can then say, okay, cool, we'll inline that and we'll inline that and inline that, inline that, inline that, and that, and that. Okay, cool. So now what we've got is just this nice, straightforward message chain. Um, and what we're doing here is we're just passing the result from one into the next. We've got a functional pipeline of operations. We start off there. Okay, so we start off trying to um, get the account. And when it fails, we just sweep it under the carpet and we carry on. So we try and get the account. And if it fails, we sweep it under the carpet. We've got nothing anymore. That's fine. Update, that bit always succeeds. But when we try to persist it, if that fails, we just sweep it under the carpet and we carry on. Um, and so there we go. That's, that's, that's basically the thing. We, we run through all the steps. If at any point any of them fail, the rest of them do nothing as they're supposed to do. And we just get our empty back at the very end. Uh, now what we do is we can see that our error handling code is kind of segregated and concise. Yes, it's interleaved on a line by line basis, but if, when you look at the code, there's a shape to error handling. We can also see which steps can fail very, very clearly because they're the ones we flat map over instead of mapping over, including this top one at the, um, at the top. But we might even start off with optional of and then flat map over that for the first step to make it even clearer. And now if we have a look at compare our happy path to our version with error handling, we can see that actually they are um, roughly the same length. Uh, compared to imperative handling, the carpet oriented version is much more concise. And if you have a look at where the error handling is, it's just much, much easier to parse what's going on with the carpet oriented version using optionals than it is to with the imperative uh, handling case. Downside of optional, of course, is there's no richness to failure. Um, and result is basically just the same as optional. You've got two halves, either you've got something or you don't. But when you don't, you've got some information about the failure. So now we move on to railway oriented programming and we get rid of the carpet metaphor. And instead we start thinking about this with the railway metaphor, which is uh, one of modeling um, our code path as having two parallel tracks, the success and, and failure. So we've got our functional pipeline of operations, exactly the same as we had with the optionals. And then underlying it, we've got two possible inputs and we've got two possible outputs. The green path along the top, that's our successes. Red path along the bottom, those are our failures. Uh, we need something to uh, sort of like start off this pipeline because we're going to start off with a value. Um, so we can have a function that takes a blue thing into a result of either a green or a red. Um, the map method, the equivalent of map method on optionals would take a success and transform it. But so any trains going on the top track would go through that function. Any trains going through the failure track would just continue straight through. Flat map. Now, uh, in this case, the failures would continue to just go straight through, but uh, anything going into the function could either come out as a purple on the top track or a red on the bottom track. And eventually we want something which resolves into a single value. So um, one way to do that is have two functions, one for successes, one for failures, uh, which transforms them both into a common type out, uh, afterwards. Quite frequently, this will be just transforming the failure type into something that's the same type as successes. For example, a HTTP response of some sort. Now, it's really important to think about uh, how we're actually going to do that. And the, the key to this is the then method, which we will get to in a moment. But first, let me illustrate the need for it. So, uh, so let's, let's say we want to extend our result class. We've got our map method. And we've got our flat map method. And we've got an if failed, which takes a failure and turns it back into a success type of some sort. So that's, that's great. But there's also all sorts of other things that we could imagine that we might want to do on these. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of those later. So it might be tempting here to say, OK, let's not make these methods because then, A, if we forget to implement it, it's not available to people. Um, and um, B, we don't have to make the class uh, really huge. Uh, you know, give people the opportunity of extending how to interact with results. Um, so let's say instead we want to say, okay, well, 
sure. We're going to say attempt um, on uh, on a result, um, which is flat map. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we've got on success. OK, cool. So we can build this out of functions quite straightforwardly. Uh, and at this point, it looks kind of similar to what the uh, optional approach looked like before we started inlining. But now if we start inlining, uh, okay, so if failed, then we do that on a, okay, cool. Uh, and then we inline this one here. Okay, and this one here, we're sort of like adding, uh, as we do this, we add the lines at the top to the bottom into the middle of this, this call. And we end up with this big, horribly nested call of, of, of operations being called in the wrong order. Um, and depending on how familiar you are with functional programming, you might think this is super readable, but I, I think it's, it's obviously, it's, it's not very intuitive. However, if instead we add this method here, then, which takes our function and then applies it to our result. So instead of saying we're going to apply our function to our result, we instead say we're going to take our result and then do a function. Um, then that allows us to uh, to inline things in a nice way. So let's have a look at a, um, some examples of some of the functions that we might want to do this for, and to try and give you an idea as to why we might want lots and lots of functions rather than just having a very small set of um, covering uh, covering everything methods. Um, I'm not going to call the methods map and flat map. Uh, these names are um, are great if you've done a ton of functional programming already, in which case you don't need to be here anyway. Um, but they're not particularly helpful for newcomers, what map means and what flat map means, they're not very evocative. Uh, there's also um, a whole bunch of functions other than map and flat map that we want to be able to use. Um, and you can have sort of like flat map failure and things like that, but then it just gets more and more um, obtuse. Um, functional programming doesn't have to be modeled after Haskell, uh, which is where a lot of these uh, these idioms come from. Uh, so let's do something that makes sense in Java with this context of this specific error handling case. So on success, um, we have a function which we apply to our successes, but failures are unchanged. It's the same as map, um, but we're calling it on success because we want various other things as well. And this is very straightforward. Uh, we take a function that turns one success type into another success type, and either we apply that function to our inner success and wrap it back in a success, or if it's a failure, we just wrap the failure and we don't modify it. Very simple function. On failure, it's sort of like the complement of on success. It uh, transforms a failure value whilst leaving successes unmodified. Looks very similar. You get a, uh, you get a function and if it's a failure, you apply it to that failure, wrap it back in a failure. And if it's a success, you just wrap it back in the success again. Attempt. Uh, this is where failures are unchanged, but successes can also yield failures, uh, where you're provided a function that can either result in a purple or a red. Here, um, we don't need to wrap our thing back in a success because the function will already give us a result. So it'll either be a success or failure. Otherwise, it looks the same as uh, map or unsuccess. But we could, uh, and then if we've got if failed, um, this is okay. So if we get a failure, then what we get out is not a result anymore. It's just whatever our green type is. So if we've got a success, we just return that. And if it's a failure, we just return the function that transforms our failure back into our successful type. You could do it like this if you wanted. Um, one thing that's very common is you might have a whole, you might be processing a bunch of stream, uh, stream of things and you want to get a whole, um, uh, run something which could either succeed or fail and then just stream those successes through. So you can do that uh, by saying, okay, well, if it's a success, then we return a stream which contains one success. And if it's a failure, then we can return a stream uh, of nothing. And then we can flat map over these results so that all the all these streams of either one or zero items then get effectively concatenated into a stream of all the things that were successful. 
uh, we might want to be able to say, okay, well, if it's a failure, I want to call back, but I don't want it to modify anything else. I just want to hit an alert or something like that. Um, so here we could just say, okay, well, if it's a success, we pass it through. Uh, if it's a failure, then we'll pass that to the router consumer, but then return the same value. And this is a, this is an interesting one because uh, this one then sort of like makes us think about, okay, sure, but now we're getting some slightly more complicated functions. Um, and one of the great things about functions is they compose. So we can even come up with a better way of doing that. So we've got this function peak, which uh, is a function which turns a consumer into a function that returns itself. And in the process causes the side effect. That means then we could say, okay, well, we're just gonna pipe it through. And if it's a success, we rewrap the success. But if it's a failure, we'll peek at it, get our side effect, and then we'll um, uh, apply that to, to our result. What's interesting about that is this is the shape we've seen before. If you have a look at uh, our on failure method, that looks incredibly similar. So what we can do is we can just call on failure with peak as an argument. Functions compose, and uh, it becomes a much easier way of reading and thinking about these things rather than having to, to create it. And that's like a, a small selection of the sorts of things that you might want to be able to do. I will cover some more of them later, but the, the point is there's a huge variety of different ways that we might want to interact with things, um, including convenience methods on being able to uh, create these things, common ways of being able to convert flaps them back to a single value, and common ways of sort of like being able to move our results between the success and failure tracks uh, in different ways. So it is valuable to make it easy to extend uh, new, new actions. Uh, so if we now try and work it using thens instead, okay, we're going to start off here by putting it straight into a um, result. It starts off successful, we haven't tried to do anything with it yet. Uh, we then attempt to read the value through the, in the object mapper. We uh, then attempt to uh, validate the change request. We then um, canonicalize it, which we'll do on any successful value. We'll then uh, attempt to get it out of the account repository. Then, if it, that was successful, we'll set the email. Then uh we'll attempt to uh update the repository uh so it's, it's, that should be consistent um lines here so uh then uh if it was successful we'll return a, an okay response and then if it failed we'll uh take our reason and put that in a bad request response cool now if we start inlining we get a uh, response or if fail and okay and now the inlining sort of like works nicely. We chain these things. They're all sort of like on their own separate line, but at the same level. And, uh, and we just end up with a nice straightforward um, chain of sequences, much the same as we had with our optionals earlier. So if we compare our happy path now to our railway oriented error handling approach, again, similar size. Uh, our error handling is segregated and concise. Uh, everything on the left is talking about the process of let's handle this, this chain of things. Everything on the right uh, is what it's actually doing at each step. Uh, we can see which steps can fail. Um, and personally, I much prefer this attempt on success, et cetera, to map and flat map for pure readability. Uh, you might disagree. You are free to use map and flat map if that's the case. Uh, but there's, there's more as well. Uh, we also convey the failure information, which we didn't have with the optionals. Uh, but it's also sort of like kind of versatile because uh, one of the things that's really nice is about how this interacts with streams. When we've got our optional approach, uh, we've got our function here, which updates the emails. And let's say instead we want to update a stream of uh, these things. Now, we could do it by taking the streams and then uh, applying uh, each of the optional things within a Lambda. That's one way approach we could do. Um, or we could say, okay, we're gonna map over the stream with our entire chain of things where 
we might say, okay, sure, we'll extract that to a function to make it clearer. So we have one thing that handles one thing, and um, and then we just map over that with each individual item. Um, however, if we compare it instead to what happens when we've got it with results, we've got our function here that um, that handles a request body. And if instead of uh, having a single request body, we instead have a stream of them, uh, what we find actually is oh, these look very similar because in the same way as a result takes a function, stream mapping takes a function to the point where the blue code does not change between these at all. Uh, so when, when we're thinking about um, doing functional approaches that might involve using streams, this uh, slots in very nicely um, because it's it's something that already works in this uh, this this approach of taking higher order functions. Recontextualization. So this is all well and good. Uh, so should you write all of your code that might ever fail to return results instead, uh, you could choose to do that. Um, however, you're still at some point going to have to interact with other people's code, particularly library code and you don't know whether or not that's going to be taking this approach. Probably not. Um, so because we don't always deal with the results, we need to be able to sort of like find a way of making that happen. So let's take a look at validate email. Um, we're using some Apache or Guava library that does that. Um, what this does is uh, it returns a Boolean uh, as to um, if it's valid. And if it's not valid, then it um, uh, it returns uh, false, and if it is valid, it returns true, but it doesn't give us back our, our answer. Well, we can just simply wrap that in a function. We, uh, we take our value, we apply our test, and then we either get back, it wraps in a success or wraps in a failure that we want to specify for that particular case. So here, um, we're saying our response here has got some sort of constant value in valid email. So we can say, we can just put our when false method inside an attempt and it turns something that was returning a Boolean into uh, something which, um, which instead returns a result. In line, don't have to worry about it at all. So um, we can convert other fail uh, failure modes to result in line, which means we can localize the use of result, which is probably a good idea, at least uh, so we don't have to mix idioms um, in a particular uh, piece of code. Um, but not have to go and modify our entire code base to make it work. So it's particularly with APIs you don't control. Talk about exceptions and streams. We talked about this earlier a bit um, and glossed over it at the time. So if you were to try and write some code like this, where you're trying to update a whole bunch of email, you, you've got an update to email method, and that method throws an exception. If you try to stream over it, it'll say unhandled exception. Um, and you might say, well, why is this an unhandled exception? The update emails method says it throws IO exception. Well, let's talk about what a function is. Um, and a function with a capital F um, is this. It's got some extra default methods as well, which we don't need to worry about. But basically, it's got this one uh, method which takes a value and returns a B. Takes an A, returns a B. If we try to do this, then we find out we've got an update, uh, an unhandled exception. The problem is assigning it to a function. Uh, because if you have a look at this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to return a new function, which returns update email. And this function has got an apply method, just like our interface. And it takes a response, just like our interface, and it returns a string. But uh, in, in order to um, handle this uh, Java IO exception, we need to make it throw IO exception. And if we try to do that, we see that the overridden method does not throw Java uh, IO to IO exception. Our apply method in our interface doesn't throw. So therefore, we cannot turn this into a function. We can handle this by creating our own in um, functional interface, which, uh, which permits us to throw exceptions. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely reasonable now for us to have our update email be an instance of a throwing function. It's just simply 
how function was defined in Java and its interplay with, uh, with exceptions. So we can do this, that's lovely. However, this is not a function. It's a small f function, but not a capital F function. Uh, so therefore, methods which take a function won't accept it. And a lot of our, uh, our then methods takes a function. The streams map takes a function. So that's not really very useful. However, we've already talked a little bit about higher order functions. Uh, higher order function is just a term for a function which takes a function and returns a function. But um, there are many small f functions which are not capital F functions. So we can write a function which takes the throwing function and returns a function. And that's fine. Um, if the word function has not ceased to have any meaning for you yet. <coughs> so here we go. Here's a method. It's, it's called try to takes the throwing function and it returns a function. And what it does, uh, it's parameterized by the exception type. Uh, uh, so what it does is it tries to apply the, uh, the throwing function. And if so, you get your result back. Um, but if it uh, throws, then we return a failure. And in this case, we're choosing to make the failure, the, except, the exception, the failure type. We could also return something that's of a different type if we wanted. One thing that's worth pointing out here is that this, this is parameterized by x, but we have to catch exception. And, we, and our, our return, the result that we get back is just an exception. Now, this is because uh, of Java's type erasure. If we were to try and make that an x, we'll, it just tells us we can't catch type parameters. And because we, we can't, um, no, we're trying to generalize over different sorts of exceptions, we can't uh, put in the catch block the concrete type because we don't yet know what it is. So we have to go for something, uh, the, the suitable bound. So. We can take our approach here, where instead of um, doing our, uh, our update emails, we can wrap it in a try to. And now we get a result, which is either a response or an exception. And yes, this gives us uh, a stream of results. But what's important here is this gives us a means to map over functions which throw exceptions, which we could not previously do. So there we go. Uh, railway pro um, oriented programming over streams. We can take our examples and map over it and just say, okay, right, we're going to wrap that in a try to. We're going to map that in a try to. And uh, by, by, by doing this, we can localize our, hand, our use of results uh, with generalized handlers. We only need to write try to once. You only need to write the Boolean converter once. Uh, you could do the same thing for Unix error codes and uh, Right, one handler, and that handles all of those things. So that's railway oriented programming, uh, composable declarative failure handling. Uh, so let's have a little bit of a bonus one. Let's talk a little bit about failure patterns, uh, which is about trying to take these principles and uh, applying them to some sort of common code shapes. Because uh, let's talk about, about caching, uh, which is sort of like the, the simplest example I can think of of a, of a recovery mechanism. Uh, let's say we want to get something out of a cache. We should go to the cache, the cache is empty. But of course, it's a cache. Uh, we don't know that there's anything in it yet. Uh, it just gets it there if we've got it recently. So what we actually really want to say is, OK, well, if it's not in the cache, fetch it from the database. Uh, and um, while we're there, uh, let's, um, we probably put it in the cache here as well, to be honest. Um, uh, but, uh, but if it's not in the database either, then we want to say, okay, well, it doesn't exist. So we've got multiple layers here is the point. Uh, but a failure is not necessarily an error. It is absolutely normal to the operation of a cache to have cache misses sometimes. I wouldn't want to call that um, a, an error case. It's just a case we want to handle. And here, um, yeah, before we've been talking about uh, attempting things where we've got a successful result and we want to then transition to the next stage, either do something which might fail. But we could also take this concept and invert it uh, and say, OK, well, if it's a success, sure, let it through. But if it was already a failure, then uh, let's try and convert it into a success. And that might succeed or it might not. 
So with the railway oriented programming approach, we start trying to get it from the, um, uh, from the cache. And then if, uh, if it still fails, we try to recover it. And then, okay, well, in this case, our external um, calling API says we should throw an exception. Okay. Um, and if you compare that to imperative Java, then uh, there's, firstly, it's shorter, which is always nice. But also, it, try, it puts things in a much more straightforward way. You've got yeah, your, your, your stream of things that you're doing with your actions on the right and your error handling on the left. Let's talk about casting. Um, so uh, the, there is a method that exists an awful lot in Java where, which is manually written very little. So I think probably when it comes to the equals method on an object, um, the proportion of instances of this that exist in code that were written by a person is probably as low as you're going to find anywhere. And it's quite complicated. You check to see if it's the same object. You check to see if it's the right type. And if it's the right type, then you cast it to the right type so that you can actually look at its properties to compare it. Quite makes sense. That's our logic. All of this is just boilerplate that, um, that needs to be written each time because it's difficult to uh, gener uh, generalize over. But what is a cast? Uh, in order to do something that requires specialization, we need to check to see if a type can be made more specific. And then we either make it more specific uh, or we don't. And we can generalize this. Uh, we can take something which says, okay, well, we're going to take, um, a, um, take an S, which may or may not be uh, castable to a subclass. Uh, if it is assignable to the subclass, then we get a result, uh, a success. Otherwise, we get a failure. Um, we might also want to say exact casting. So the type is exactly the same as opposed to assignable from, but that, that's a choice of how we want to go about it. We could use casting on our equals method. So if it's true, um, if it's the same object, that's fine. If it's null, definitely not equal. And then we could just say, okay, well, with this, we're going to cast it to the type. And then uh, if it's successful, uh, we'll check that the numbers are the same and the texts are the same. And then if, it's fa if we fail to cast it, then they're not the same. It's not that much shorter, um, although sort of like the cast method sort of like is a bit safer. But that's our logic. Um, that's the logic that's specific to our type as opposed to generalizable over all types. And that is a function. And a function is a value. And values can be injected. So we can strike out all of the generic parts. And then we can just uh, have a nice no low boilerplate implementation, which just takes the two objects um, and then a function which compares them. So instead of that. So yeah, you'd need to write the, the, the boilerplate once. And then throughout the rest of your code, you can use this nice clean uh, cleaner function, which where like the entire content of the method is actually relevant to your type. Let's talk about matching. Uh, if you've used uh, proper functional programming languages, pattern matching is an incredibly powerful way of um, being able to sort of like break down decision logic. Uh, so let's say, for example, I want to choose what game I'm going to play tonight with my friends. If my friends are nice and fit, then we'll play a bit of football. Otherwise, we're going to play Monopoly. And we could do it with this if-else block. We could do it with a ternary. Um, Either of these approaches does not scale particularly well. Uh, we can we can start going on having you know sequential if else if blocks etc. Uh, but it, be it becomes quite difficult to read and quite boilerplatey. Um, trying to use ternaries with more than two options is is not uh, particularly um, aesthetically pleasing. It's not very readable. We, if we've got a straightforward um, case of, okay, well, we've got a, a simple answer to a question, we could use a switch statement and that wouldn't be too bad, although switch statements ain't great. Um, they are improving significantly as Java 
um, evolves, uh, but they're still ain't great. But we can model this as failures. We start off um, with complete failure of friends, uh, by which I mean we have not yet chosen a game. And then if the friends are fit, then uh, we'll uh, play football. Otherwise, we've still got a failure. Uh, we could then have a look, okay, we're going to try a different question. Um, and if they have uh, enough controllers, then we'll have a success of uh, Mario Kart, otherwise that. And then if, if we failed, then we play Monopoly. Now, I, I acknowledge that this is not yet um, any better than the auto answers I've, I've shown you. Um, but you can see how the mechanisms we've uh, introduced um, allow us to write code in this way. What's cool though here is this and this are exactly the same. And because they're exactly the same, we can abstract those out uh, into we check our thing. And if, we, if it's good, then we uh, generate our result. Otherwise, we pass the thing through because we still don't know what we're going to be doing with our result. And then that allows us to use uh, that thing there to then inline these options. Uh, which means that, okay, our if true thing, that's going to be generic library code. So we're really only looking at the top bit. Uh, and we've abstracted, but we can go even further because this, this structure here of starting with a failure, recovering through a whole list of options and then using our last default option, we can abstract that too. Uh, and write a match function, which basically just streams over the, the cases, trying to recover, uh, and then eventually um, trying to do the, the last case, which gives us a shape sort of like this, where we match over our friends and we've got very, very simple statements. If friends are fit, then we play football. If we have enough game pads, we play Mario Kart. We can even replace the then with an otherwise, uh, because this is just our match function doesn't need to return a result. It can return an uh, a, a possibly failed match, which then has a different method on it. Uh, and what's really nice about this is that we can easily extend it um, because we don't need to just use the if true method. We can have any sort of way of determining whether or not to apply something. So if I'm playing with specifically with Tim and Gary, uh, then we always play Settlers of Catan rather than Football Mario Kart or Monopoly. And our if equal method is really straightforward. We just say, if it's true that the value is equal to it, uh, that we, we want to compare it to. Um, one line I kept basically, uh, to, in order to reduce that one. We could use our casting mechanism that we talked about earlier to have a look at the type of something, uh, where our if type casts to the subclass, and then if we successfully casted to it, we turn the work colleagues into a game of cards against humanity, which is a Staggeringly bad idea, but um, uh, it, it demonstrates how, how the code could work. Um, in, this, and in the same way that too little abstraction can lead to readability traps, let's say we want to have a case where if we don't have all evening, we're just going to play a quick game of rock, rock, paper, scissors. It's very easy to miss the negation. But here, we could just introduce a new uh, a, a much more direct language where we don't need to have that negation. We don't need to wrap things in a knot. We can just turn our top level thing to be a wrapper to, to, to clean things up for us. Uh, and this is talking about a generalized way of going about it. If you've got a very, uh, a very spe uh, specific domain, you could turn all of this into domain specific language as well. I think this is the last one that I've got here, nearly done now. We can also have a look at validation. So one way we, which we might choose to approach validation is let's say people want to know if they can ride a roller coaster. Um, and there are many possible reasons why somebody may not be permitted to ride a roller coaster. I'll be going through these as we go along. Um, if they're too short, then it's not gonna be safe for them. They shouldn't ride. If they're pregnant, then it's medically unsafe for them and their child. Uh, if they have a heart condition, again, it's medically unsafe for them to ride. Um, if they're too large, unfortunately, we can't just can't get the restraints to fit the case. So again, it'd be unsafe to ride. 
Um, and if somebody jumped the queue, if somebody just went straight to the front, um, then they violated the park rules and they're not allowed to get, yeah, you're out of here. Now, what's interesting here is that there could be multiple reasons why somebody's not allowed to ride a roller coaster. Uh, and I am constantly annoyed by things, by cases where you try to submit something for, for, and you get an error back and you fix the error, and then you get another different error back. You want to give people all the errors up front so they can fix all of them in one go. So what is validation? It's non-transformative. Um, you, get, you get an input and that doesn't change what it is that you're validating. Uh, so you could model it as the success type being the input type. There are multiple possible errors. So any failure type needs to include a list. But if uh, we want to continue running our checks after a failure, so one way we could do that is have our failure type also contain the uh, the input type. So after a failure, you can still take that failure and have a look at um, the value that you're trying to validate. We could uh, define a, a fail validation as looking at something like this. So it contains the, the value that you're trying to assess and it contains a list of errors of our failure type. And the validation step would be able to uh, accept both its success and a failure, and it could, return, it could output either a success or a failure. If it has a success going in, then if it, that step could fail, putting us on the failure track, or that step could succeed, uh, leading to remaining on the green track. If it comes in as a failure, it's going to go out as a failure, but it might go out as a new failure with an additional reason. Um, and we could have uh, something like a rejective method, which says, OK, well, if it was a success, we'll check it. If it's good, it's still a success. If it's not, it's a new failure with our new error. If it's a failure, uh, then we run check it. And if that check succeeded, it's it's the same failure. We're not adding anything new to it. But if it's um, if we this check failed again, then we want to add that new reason to our um, existing list of failure errors. Uh, so we could take instead of doing it with this approach here, where we've got each of these if statements one by one, we could have something which um, takes a person and then lists all of the various reasons why we might, might reject them. Uh, so we already get uh, a full failure context. It's not just a list. Um, and instead of all of this boilerplate that's sort of consistent, we end up with um, every word there is relevant. Like there's almost nothing there that's um, uh, that's that's boilerplate. You might say the rejective method. Well. There are also other um, methods that we could use there. In terms of our readability traps, uh, instead of having, okay, well, that's got a situation where um, somebody doesn't hasn't actually paid for the rides, but it's very easy to mix the uh, the the exclamation mark symbol there. Whereas here, we can just say, well, we'll accept it if they've got a, a wristband. Um, and if they haven't got that, so that's sort of like got an automatic negation in the naming of things. Uh, we can also say, okay, well, instead of just taking a value uh, to reject somebody with, we could also take a function that calculates a value uh, based on the input. So we could have much, we could have more detailed, more personalized rejections. We can have conditionals in there. Uh, so instead of having to have a complicated uh, jumped queue method that, that excludes the, the VIP, we can put that logic at the top level and say, unless the person is a VIP, uh, reject them if they jump the queue. But if they were a VIP, let them go. We can also do stuff like lensing in where we compose things to say, okay, well, we're not going to validate a person. We're going to validate somebody's backpack uh, to check to see if it's got, um, if it's threatening our park, either infectious animal diseases, or they're, they're just not spending enough at the, uh, at the the double price Burger Kings on site. So we can just wrap those up because functions compose. Because it's all just functions. Um, and that's that's basically it. So failure patterns, uh, it's a way of abstracting common code shapes into DSL using nice, straightforward, easily composed functions. That's basically it. Um, if you want to find my library, like I said, I don't want, um, I'm not trying to pitch this library. Um, I think it's, but if you want to have a look at how it could be done, that's the best way you could find it. So uh, 
questions. Can I uh, can I let uh, Dave uh, sort of like be the question master here? Um, yeah, we didn't yeah. actually get any questions in the chat uh, related to the content. Um, oh, yeah, here they come now. I did see Duffy um, raise his hand. Please go ahead. You might need to unmute yourself. Um, well, it's pressed wrong button. Okay, we, we have uh, one question from uh, Michael. Um, well, before that, um, there's a question present... from Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question is apart from some extra boilerplate code, were there any major differences in how you would write this functional style code between Java and, let's say, house call? or other true functional languages? Uh, so a proper functional language is going is not going to need um, some of the, the boilerplate I put in place because it's it's handling that. But, um, and um, uh, however, the general principle is the same. I'm not trying to sort of like massively advocate for a programming style here, but more the idea of being able to sort of like model things as Okay, well, there's two possibilities, and we shift between them, and it could be each each time, and various things, various functions will or will not apply based on the inputs. Um, that's um, that's the point one I'm trying to make, and the point two I'm trying to make is then you can use those ideas to sort of like compose bigger things. Um, Haskell, Scala, even Kotlin will um, it'll just be naturally easier to use those sorts of functional compositional approaches. Yeah, another question from Daniel here. Um, the question is, is this something you expect would be useful in a low latency system or is it likely to be too garbage? Too so, so the way I've implemented it at the moment is, uh, is relatively garbage. Each operation will allocate a new result. Um, it is possible to, uh, to do a version of this which doesn't do that. If you chose, um, if, if you wanted that, um, I also suspect that um, uh, once we get um, so sort of like value types uh, on the stack, um, then those will permit us to do this in a garbage-free way as well. I don't, I don't know whether that's coming in Java 17 or Java 18. As it is, um, if you really, really care about high performance, low latency, zero garbage. I would not recommend using this approach, uh, but you're probably already making a whole bunch of compromises in terms of code readability uh, in pursuit of that anyway. Yeah. Um, I think, um, as I understood the subject, I mean, uh, this well well oriented program is more about results in case uh, there is a good outcome, we should kind of uh, uh, let it go for green or maybe the opposite for, for red. And I think, how can we, how can we let this railway programming communicate with uh, um, uh, Java code? Like, is there, for example, that when in case, in case we have a good result, can we show up a, 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 a message? Okay, everything went well, or can we just, okay, say, okay, it's just, it went well. We have, we know that it's successful. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a value um, and you can very easily um, say, well, do this when it's a successful value and do that when it's a failure value. And that is entirely up to the caller. Uh, in fact, yeah. that's that's the that's the appeal of it. It forces uh, the caller to say what to do on a success and what, what to do on a failure. Uh, so, yes, you can make that do pretty much whenever you want. Okay. Hi, Tom. I've got one question. Um, sure. Thanks very much for a really good presentation. I would love to be able to see these slide decks because I, I want to study some of the generic code because it's a, <laughs> uh, it, it looks quite interesting. Um, I had a specific question uh, that I noted down um, where you're actually using two different types on the result, the S and the S1. Yeah. So I was just trying to understand what's the difference between those two? Like, why do we need to kind of distinguish one from the other? What's the difference there? Ah, so so this is uh, some shorthand. S stands for success, 
F stands for failure. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for example, well, clear. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, at, at any one point you might have, I don't know, an, an enum of possible different failure states, and that would be your F type. And the thing that you're calculating on, that would be your S type. Yeah. We have another question from Aroldo Dimitri. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Do you think that this approach can generate any issue if the project is being compiled to native, like some application are doing using Gravel, Gravel VM? So this is all just very, very straightforward Java under the hood. It's just a different way of um, thinking um, about it. Uh, so I don't, uh, I, I don't see any uh, issues um, compiling to native here. It's not, do, it's not doing anything clever under the hood at all. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of a different way of thinking. Just, yeah. OK. So yeah, guys, question. feel free to ask questions. If you have questions, you have the opportunity to, to ask Tom. So there's and, a question here from uh, Chris saying, one of the reasons I struggle to use this style of programming is that it assumes a forward flow of control, one stage to the next to the next. Did I get that right? Absolutely. This is all about pipeline of, uh, of, of, of steps, which we just um, give out, give up. Usually when a failure occurs, I either want to bum out altogether and return an error response to a client, or I want to undo the previous stages using usually in reverse order and then bum out. So in the first case, um, when a failure occurs, I want to bum out altogether. This supports that very well, because then it's on the failure track and all of your functions sitting on the success track will be ignored. It'll just go straight through to the end of your error code. If you want to undo the previous stages, if you've been sort of like, creating a state that needs to be rolled back, then uh, this is less so. Um, uh, this isn't really well suited to that. This is very much a case of it's best suited when you're modeling things as uh, a chain of operations on values without side effects. That's where it's best suited. Uh, it may be possible to make it work um, so that it's got some sort of undoing of previous stages um, built into it uh, for a case. I haven't really thought about that, um, but it's not something that I would naturally reach to as the right tool for that sort of problem. Cool. Thank you. That makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, and it's got me thinking about whether there's another complementary abstraction that actually does handle the sorts of cases I'm thinking about. So yeah, it's going to be something to think about. Yeah, I could, I could certainly imagine that you do a, a similar thing where you've got a success or a failure, and then um, a set of uh, cleanup steps that you would need to do in case you get a failure at the end of sort of like a third parameter of some sort. Um, that, if it, um, that, that might turn out to be worth exploring. Um, but like I said, this isn't really generally used in that approach. It's generally used in a case where, um, where, where you, you wouldn't have side effects as you go.